This is a podcast from WOR. 12 minutes after 7 o'clock on my telephone this morning, and we're still making, we're still doing pretty good here on the radio, so I'm happy to say that. Uh, Ava Moskowitz, uh, formerly city council member, but she's also the founder and CEO of the Success Charter Network and Harlem Success Academy. She has written a book, too, called Mission Possible, How the Secrets of Success Academies Can Work in Any School. Ava, how are you? Good morning. Uh, good morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been a while since you and I have, ha- have talked. You know, the, the whole thing about charter schools why why is there this this negativity towards them well i think uh, there are a lot of reasons and, and most of the source of the criticism comes from the teachers union itself but you know competition to a public monopoly is a serious threat and it's a little odd because uh here in this country we support choices uh in many many walks of life but when you talk about choices in education the monopoly gets a little nervous they they certainly do and yet at the same time obviously uh, your charter schools and charter schools employ teachers They're, the okay. teachers are no different than other <laughs> teachers on uh, public school teachers <laughs> Uh, not only are they no different, they're uh, former union members. Uh, we pay them uh, significantly more than uh, the district, um, and we treat them like the professionals they are. So it's not the teachers. I had 57,000 teachers apply to work at our schools, um, and these are union members. They're part of the system. Um, but what teachers care most about is being able to teach. And um, unfortunately, there's so much disorder and um, chaos often in district schools that teachers don't get to do what they do best, uh, which is uh, teach. Is this a management problem on the public side? Um, Well, our crisis in public education, I think, has a few sources. You've got the massive educational bureaucracy on the one hand in district schools, and you've got the labor contracts on the other hand. And between management and labor, uh, it is very, very hard to put teaching and learning uh, front and center. I read a statistic uh, just recently that suggested that uh, principals only get to spend in district schools 6% of their time on teaching and learning. Uh, well, that's a pretty, uh, that's a recipe for uh, low student student achievement. You need principals in the classrooms really with a laser-like focus on how to improve the quality of the instruction. So basically what you've done with your success charter network is is break out, is to, is, is to take a piece of the bread and break it off the loaf and, and, and put it on the side and, and uh, disconnect it from all of the baggage which uh, holds it down. Yes, I and mean, we've absolutely done that. We, we use the simple freedom uh, that we have to design world-class schools. And I, I would just say there's one other thing that we do, and, and this is really the subject of the book, and your listeners can access it at uh, readmissionpossible.com. Uh, but um, we believe that uh, one of the profound mistakes of American public education is the underestimation of children intellectually. Uh, we go around saying they're short, the kids, but they're not stupid, and this kind of dumbing down of the curriculum has really um, put a ceiling on what our children can learn, and we are huge believers in rigor. Now, the rigor just, doesn't cost money. You just got to implement it. You saw last week uh, the story on the survey taken of children, I think, third to eighth grade, and asked whether, whether or not they were bored with their classes, and, and the resounding answer was yes. And we've known that for a long time, but all you have to do is look at the faces of the children. They're bored out of their mind, um, in part because it's so repetitive and, and we're not pressing the kids intellectually. This, this seems, I mean, if, if, if I flew in from outer space, and I listen to the conversation that you and I have had in the past and are having this morning and the ones I have with Dennis Walcott and Mayor Bloomberg and all of the other people that I speak with when it comes to Merrill Tisch, when it comes to education, I would go, well, this certainly seems easy enough to fix. 
it, it is. And, and by the way, we don't really have a choice. I mean, uh, international competition is going to eat our lunch. If you look at the curriculums of um, countries around the world, they're not making this mistake. Um, so it is easy enough to fix. We have to up the rigor. I mean, our fourth grade math curriculum, that's what other countries are doing in first and second grade. So we just got to, we can take the same curriculum, we just need to take the higher grades and we need to teach it in the lower grades. We need to up our game and up our expectations. But on the national basis, we are not doing that because of the, all of the constituency that you mentioned before. They refuse to let it happen because they, they, they themselves are threatened. And it is a threat that I don't understand because it will take all of those people reconfigured, but all of those people to make this happen. Well, I, I think you're right in that there's a question of, of political will, um, but we have invested, uh, you know, we've doubled our investment in public education over the last half century, and our results have remained flat. And with, you know, we're not going to have an increasing amount of money for education. We're going to have to live within our means and do a lot better for the kids. Ava, as, as you well know, whether you agree with it or not, the No Child Left Behind bill uh, required the states to meet certain goals. Almost every single state has been given a waiver because they were unable to even even meet those modest goals. Well, this is sort of the dance. And look, on Tuesday, New York uh, State is going to release the test scores, and they keep moving the bar. When the results aren't good, they lower the passing rate and so forth. And it, it really, it just hurts the kids. We have to pick a standard, and we have to have faith in the children. Uh, and I would argue the reason we're not able to meet the standards is not the kids, but it's the adults. And we have to train the adults better and not keep fiddling with the bar. Do you really need to train the, the teachers more? Oh, my goodness. Don't get me started on schools of education. Um, we really need to make sure, you know, if you take a teacher who didn't have herself a great junior high school English teacher and didn't have a great high school English teacher and then went to college and I don't know where the professor was and then got a master's degree, you might not have someone who can write really well. And then we wonder why the children can't write. The same goes for fractions. I ask candidates all the time, which is bigger, a third or a fourth, and they, they have trouble uh, with, with that. So um, we're going to have to really invest in making sure our teachers are better educated before we hire them. What percentage of teachers fall in that category you just described? Well, of the 57,000 that applied to work for me, I had trouble finding the 156 I needed. Stop it. Stop no. it. Really? Yes, really. I'm stunned. It's a big problem. It's a big problem. Well, then, well, until we get the teachers better, there's no way the kids are going to get better. Yeah, and that, that's the argument in the book, is that the kids are the easy part of this equation. Um, we have to make sure that the adults are ready. And when I say the adults, it's the teachers need to be ready to teach, and the principals need to be letter, ready to lead. Has it always, how long have you been in the education business? Well, I've only been running schools for this is my seventh year. I've been thinking about it and involved professionally for about 15. All right. So that's that's not a huge amount of time. I'm, my question was going to be, has, has this teacher education problem been getting worse? Well, I'm a historian uh, by training, so I can give you that vantage point. And it's, it's a little bit ironic, but when the labor market was segregated, when you had an almost all-female teaching force because women couldn't go in and couldn't be doctors and lawyers and investment bankers and anything else under the sun, you actually had a much more highly educated workforce. Because they you know, prepared themselves for the job that they, that they knew was available to them. And you had, you had a very talented group of people who were prohibited. You know, I'm not suggesting we should go back to those days, but they were prohibited from becoming doctors and lawyers and investment bankers. Um, so you, you actually had uh, a very strong uh, workforce. This is in the you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, and sure. 60s. Right, right, right. Uh, and therefore, you had a better result uh, coming out the back door. Correct. 
And that it is it, again, this seems so simplistic, yet I know how complicated it is, but it seems that on, on sort of the gestalt, the large picture, it seems so easy. Well, I, I think it's easy if we're willing as a nation to take the steps. And we're going to have to deal with the schools of education. They're not producing what we need um, uh, for, for to educate our young people. That That's a political football, right? The schools of education want to see themselves as knowing how to do this. And when you talk about alternatives to the schools of education, in order to hire a teacher, they have to be certified. Uh, the schools of education have an oligopoly in terms of training our teachers. It's the politics that's very hard to change. It's not that we don't have the know-how to do so. Do the deans of these education schools, do they agree with you um, when you talk to them quietly? Quietly, yes. Quietly, yes. And you have had a few. Arthur Levine, who was the president of Teachers College, came out, wrote a book, and said, this is not working, and we need to change it. Uh, he's also no longer the president of Teachers College and has moved on to other things. Um, but it's it's hard to turn the tanker around, even with some realization that there's a pretty big problem. Ava Moskowitz, with her story this morning, uh, it's not a pretty one either. Are you going to run for mayor? Uh, not in this round, uh, but I hope to serve the city in the future. That's an interesting answer. All right, we'll see where that one goes. Ava, always a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having oh, me. Good luck with the book, too. Uh, Mission Possible, that's the name of her book at missionpossible.com. <laughs> this has been a podcast from WOR. 